you need your systems for success and your systems for success are not, they're not one size fits all. So my systems for what works for me are gonna be very different from what works for Tracy. But what you have to do is constantly be building what your systems for success are. And then after you get done with something, it's asking what worked, what didn't, what do I change? And like, how could I improve, right? To be able to sharpen those systems in order to like help you get it right. I'm Tracy Lovejoy. And I'm Shannon Lucas. We are the co-CEOs of Catalyst Constellations, which is dedicated to catalyzing innate change makers to accelerate positive change around the world. This is our podcast, Move, Move Fast, Fast, Break Shit, Burn Out, where we highlight catalysts that are creating amazing change in the world. In that reality, I am delighted to have time today with Jenny Cody Pangas, known by friends as JCK. She is a catalyst with an interesting hero's journey, which we're going to hear about today. In 2020, an accident gave her a gift of the beginner's mindset. She had to relearn everything from how to talk, how to walk, how to be in the world. And when she did, she was able to connect dots in ways that others never had, even though she was already a catalyst. So losing that design bias for how we've always done it has helped her build technology that's never been done before, which she's been doing over and over again if you take a look at her her background. So I'm so excited to get to have her tell us more about her story. JCK, take it away. Please, please tell us, how do you relate to the concept of Catalyst? Um, oh gosh, um, I know exactly. First off, thank you so much for having me here. It's an absolute honor. Um, I remember exactly where I was in this very basement um, when I heard there was a top five podcast that Chad and Cheese had put out. And um, I was number one, which was like, it was a clip of me for number one. And I was so excited because it was like the top podcast of the year. And um, number two was you guys. And I remember exactly where I was, where I had that aha moment of, I'm not broken. There's a name for it. It was like, it was one of those pivotal moments where, you know, Superman finds out that he has powers or (laughs) Spider-Man figures out that he was bitten by a spider. It was like my hero's journey. Like I had met my guide and, um, it was incredible. I never listened to number three. I probably, sorry, Chad, but I should probably go back and listen to that. But I just went into like finding this podcast and finding everything that was out there in terms of content. And like, then I realized, oh my gosh, I know so many other catalysts. They're in my inner circle because we all found each other. And I think I've gifted uh, your book probably more than a, uh, and it's now my favorite gifted book. Uh, and so, I absolutely relate to the concept of of, of catalyst. Um, for me, it's it's probably the closest label that I can figure out for like how I work in the world. Um, and like you mentioned uh, in the in the opening, I have a slightly interesting kind of story arc. Um, so let's just dive in there. Yeah, yeah. So um, Tracy, I was a a catalyst before twenty twenty. And there's a reason why I'm going to differentiate between these these, uh, kind of before and after. Um, Before 2020, I I was a catalyst. I was a person who could figure out anything and got known to be that project resource that when you didn't have somebody to put forward for a role, they'd call me because they knew I could learn. And so I had this really interesting and robust tool belt with a lot of different tools, a lot more than my my peers typically would have, Um, but they were all really sharp. And then in um, in 2020, I um, was one of the first patients in Minnesota with COVID-19, and um, and I was in the hospital, and uh, I fell and I hit my head, and um, I lost everything that was in the rearview mirror, like everything from who my children were um, to who I was, uh, to how the world worked, to what words were. I mean, it's. It was a it was a complete and total reset, and um, so my journey post that has been really interesting because um, again, as a catalyst, one of the things that you understand is like you understand how to unpack problems. I know this now, knowing like what a catalyst does, 
And for me, that problem was like, who am I? What do I do? Why should I care? And how does the world work? Right. And um, I was very, very thankful that this was during COVID-19. So there wasn't as many interpersonal situations like the world was kind of for the most part on Zoom. And so I was able to like dip my toe back into 2D interactions versus like the 3D interactions and then 4D interactions. But um, but yeah, I don't know what question, where, where do you want me to go next? So head injury happened, complete and total reset, um, lost the rear view mirror and really had to go into starting to, to learn back other, you know, how the world worked. There's so much about your experience that I'm curious about. You know, one is, and this isn't what I'll ask you, but just the the compassion that leaps out as a parent myself when you said, you know, losing the rear view mirror of your kids, like it just, it, it makes, my, even just re-saying that there's like tears on the edge and it makes my body ache. And um, for this conversation, I wonder if it's more relevant, but I'd love you to guide me uh, to talk about what that process was to reconnect yourself, that healing journey because from what I understand, there was a lot of catalyticness in there. And yet this unbelievable guide in helping us understand ourselves and who we are as problem solvers. And these physical cues you were having that if we could embed them in ourselves as catalysts, it's like this, like you've unlocked something that in our research we haven't. And I would love to have you talk about that. Absolutely. Yes. And the, the, First part, just really quick as, as a mom, um, I have three incredible kids and um, they are 14. My oldest is named Bolivia, which is what I, the name of the technology I co-developed um, with another company. Uh, I have a 10 year old Matthew and I have a five year old Macrina. And one of the things that I've really come to realize and recognize is that for my kids, their memories of me lie with them. They weren't in me. And so once I was able to understand that, like, I didn't, that wasn't lost. It was just there. I had to ask those right sharp questions to help the story come forward. And that it actually built so much stronger connections. Um, it was really special. Um, but as you were alluding to, um, I uh, learned very quickly after my head injury and, and this is probably one of the things that maybe most catalysts don't quite understand, but um, as a catalyst or as a human for how I work in the world, I have a finite amount of what I'm able to put into the world before I end up stopping. So it's not like I can just spread the peanut butter thinner or like I can't go further. And what I mean by that is when um, shortly after my head injury, I could only be on screens for 15 minutes at a time or I would pass out. <laughs> um, and it wasn't just screens, but it was screens or reading or like in engaging my brain in different ways. I was cleared to uh, listen to country music and classical music. Um, and that was it. And like little by little, I was able to kind of um, to start going back and adding a little bit more time here and there. But it still didn't change the fact that when I hit that wall, there there was like a dead stop like because i would be i would be on the ground um we were in at waterloo ontario um and sometimes it's with certain different sensory experiences but there was some like really blinking lights and i know my guardrails in terms of like what i can and what i can't do and i'm able to to notice like when i'm starting to go into that like you can't go there zone um and so i remember i was like i was laying on the ground because we couldn't get the lights to stop blinking and so i was laying on the ground covering my eyes because I was like, I'm going to pass out. Like I can sense my body going there and I want to be on the ground when I pass out instead of like fall again. Cause we all know what happens when that happens. And so, um, so yeah, it's just about like, I've had to get really good about knowing my unique blueprint of how I exist in the world. Um, what are those different, like, I guess like, uh, signals that I'm hitting the point where I need to be careful because once I've hit that like pass out mode, my ability to function the next day and even the next two days is depleted because I've, I've pressed my brain to farther than I can go. Um, and it's hard sometimes because some days there's like incredibly awesome people that you just want to have conversations with and to have to be like, I really want to, to continue this conversation, but I can't talk anymore. Like, yeah. 
I can we re, can we you know restart this tomorrow? Um, I've never had somebody that said no. First off, so there's like that imposter syndrome of like I feel bad about it, but like telling people what you need and like and what you need to be like safe and exist in the world. It turns out um, people are pretty on board with that. So yeah, I don't know what you do recall from before your accident. So forgive me if I move into questions that you're like, no, stupid question, Tracy. <laughs> you mentioned that you you know you were a catalyst before the accident. So there's some, you know, kind of element of self that that's retained. And so I wonder if you have a sense of you can no longer spread the peanut butter too thin and you have literal blinking lights that tell you like this is the sign. Could you have used that to help your younger self, right? Because I'm assuming and hearing that, that you did spread the peanut butter too thin, that you didn't recognize what would have been met, maybe metaphoric blinking lights. Maybe there were actual blinking lights that was easier to push past. But yeah. what, what would you have done differently knowing that people have grace, knowing that you can speak your truth, knowing there's a point at which you're not as effective? Yeah, um, I think there, I think there absolutely were guardrails that were there and they were more invisible guardrails. Um, I, what I've learned through my head injury is that they were hard guardrails, not soft guardrails, right? Um, had I known that earlier, I think I could have, I guess, exercised or developed my catalyst muscle in a lot safer and healthy way. Um, versus taking it to the point where it was absolutely going to crash and then having that recharge moment and then like doing it again, rinse and repeat, being able to understand that like, okay, hey, we just hit that soft guard rail or there's that speed bump, right? Like, and now we're going to slow down because we're going to hit, we're, we're going to crash into the cement barrier. We don't want to do that because when we crash into the cement barrier, sometimes the airbags can go off, right? Um, I think had I known that existed, it, it definitely would have changed things. And I think if I look at the arc that I've been able to like just develop and like the almost hockey stick that I've been able to to learn in the last just two years in my own journey, I think I may have seen a much steeper arc like that or like steep incline versus kind of this like peaks and valleys, lows and highs. And then they eventually like your, you know, baseline is going to increase. Um, I think that there's a lot safer way to do it. Are there things that you can recall that were warning signs that you didn't recognize as such at the time? Um, so I am able to remember the world um, mostly through like journals that I yeah. had. And I gave myself a couple weeks since I was able to read to read through them and kind of like collect the dots. And then I actually got rid of them because I was like, OK, this is a rear view mirror. Like I can have it as like a guiding post, but I don't want it to become um, everything. And like, I don't yeah. want to do that. And so um, I, I also have some incredible friends who have been able to like connect the dots in terms of like, this is how you were before, yeah. right? And um, some, uh, there, there was a consistent theme to, you would get into these modes where you would just be go, 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 and we could see it, but it didn't matter what anybody said, like you were just gonna keep going because it's all you knew. Yeah. And so I think that lack of awareness of, of like, being able to see the signal, right? Like I, I was missing the lens to see the signal. Um, had I had that, it may have helped me listen to people around me, right? Or be able to just take better care of myself because post head injury, like the biggest thing that I recognized is self-care is it's not optional, it's foundational. It's a need yeah. to have, it is not a nice to have. If you are somebody who's, whose brain can do these incredible, amazing things, if you don't allow the ability to recharge, to sleep, to eat, to like, you know, to have silence, like you aren't going to be able to reach your maximum potential because you're not taking care of that incredible, incredible, incredible muscle that is that that really makes you who you are. Yeah. Thank you for that gift. It's, it just so occurs to me, you know, I want everybody to have that moment to really reflect on what is what is my signal? What is it that they're, if I really surveyed my friends, as you're talking about, what is it they see that I'm putting off that says, this is a danger zone mm -hmm. that and I haven't become aware of or listened to? 
Yeah, it's like a red, yellow, green. And a lot of the times those people who are in that inner circle of ours can recognize and we've gone to green to yellow or yellow to green or, you know, green to yellow, yellow to red. Um, and sometimes that like, oh, I can do this. Like, I'm, I'm just going to continue going through. I can do anything, right? Like that part can kind of hold us back sometimes. And uh, people around us love us and they want us to be the best versions of ourselves. And so being able to pause for a second and ask like, okay, what is it that they might be saying here too? And not to let that inner monologue that says like, oh, they don't like me or they're, they're trying to attack me or X, Y, Z, whatever it might be like silencing that for a second and asking like what really is going on here um and like if this is somebody who cares for me, like cares about me um what am i not gleaning from their insights right um yeah. so incredibly important but also it's think like as a catalyst you have to figure out what is your yellow sun and what is your kryptonite and then you've got to build systems to ensure that you get more of your yellow sun and for people who don't understand what that is Yellow sun is what makes Superman's powers come forward. And so kryptonite is what takes Superman's powers away. And so being able to identify like, what are those things that like drive or drain me so that I can build life that works for me is really, really important because as a catalyst, you can do anything. Like you can absolutely do anything. You figure it out. You will always be able to, you know, reverse engineer the problem and, and to, Get it right probably better than most people that are out there in the world can um but some of those things that you will do will drain your battery much faster than others will and you have to identify what those things are and if you have to flex into those things you need to make sure that you are creating a day and systems around you to um prevent prevent that uh that battery drain from hitting that cement wall yeah yeah um, it makes perfect sense and I'm so grateful and we'll stop looking past early 2020 <laughs> like yep the the journals are gone we can we can close the door I would love to turn us to talk to, about what was recovery like because getting to hear a little bit of this story and the catalyst frame that you that you brought to this is so inspiring so you know tell us tell us the memories that are alive well you know you you have 15 minutes at a go on screens in a moment when we're all virtual so how did you get your brain back together? <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, one thing is I was never really good at being alone and being by myself. Um, I think I was potentially a little scared of it, who knows, but I had to learn how to do that because I couldn't be around my kids, I couldn't be around my family, like there was COVID going on and my brain didn't work and I couldn't be on screens, which is like the main, main method of being able to connect with people during this time um which was so interesting uh but one thing i did still have uh was my ability to see when probably like, situations were not going to work and so there is this key moment with uh my doctor and um this was after i was in kidney failure and had the head injury and was was talking through different recovery options and they had said we want you to go back to your apartment because i was rebuilding my house post water damage um and work on puzzles and legos and this was on Zoom. It was in my 15 minutes and we had to like count it down to make sure that I didn't hit that guardrail. And, um, and I was like, that's not going to work. And uh, the doctor is like, well, why is that? Do you have a thing against Legos? And I was like, no, I have a thing against like solutions that aren't going to be successful. And he looked at me like, like I was just so matter of fact. And I'm like, yeah, that's not going to work. I was like, but here's what might. I was like, I want you to clear me to do electrical. <laughs> and the guy's face was just like, head injury girls say what like electrical <laughs> we're just in the hospital and i was like uh you want me to do basic repeatable tasks to retrain my brain i've got 60 outlets to do and those are a basic repeatable puzzle so you get what you want i get what i want and that's success and so i finally got him to say yes and then i said all right let's talk about flooring and he was like are you kidding me right now and i was like well, you know, flooring's got a design element in it too. And he's like, <laughs> I think he had seen at this point that like saying no to me was probably not gonna work. Um, and so he said, <laughs> that's fine, but you were just in kidney failure. Uh, you can't lift more than 10 pounds. And so I did. 
Oh, you can kind of see them and my shoes. It's beautiful. 1,350 square feet of flooring that I, uh, entirely on my own, that I laid into place one piece at a time. And so um, little by little, like Tracy, I worked on to bigger things. Um, and so like I replaced my entire electrical service, like my panel and like ran a 220 volt line and like replaced walls. And, you know, all of it was able to, connect those dots, but I'll never forget when I was doing these floors, there was this key moment where I was like, I, I mean, cause you're on cement, like on your knees and your body's hurting. And I hit a point where I was like, I'm just going to go outside. I'm going to go like get the stuff out from the shed or whatever. And I walked into the shed and, um, everything in the shed was drenched and destroyed. And I looked up and the roofers who had really screwed up my house had pulled the roof, but they didn't put a roof back on. And so the rope was open and I was like, okay, okay. So I knew the components of a roof and how to put them back on, but I didn't know how they went into place. And um, this is where I actually hit my guardrails a couple of times because I, I had books on how to put roofs together and I would go to read it and I would get to that 15 minute mark and I would pass out. And um, so I had a pause and I was like, okay, <laughs> This is a situation you've got like what's the problem I need to put a roof back on I cannot do this I cannot learn it what's another way I could do this. And so I called one of my friends who owns a roofing company and he came over and he side by side taught me how to put the roof back together and I put the roof on. And so he had to teach me that like system for that because I couldn't read. One of my superpowers has always been the ability to learn complex things um, and be able to take the 15,000 piece Lego set and make it into like easy to understand Duplo so that not only I could understand it, but other people could too. And um, I couldn't do that. And so I had to figure out this way around it in order to still solve the problem. So yeah, but then I um, eventually went back into the work world and uh, I couldn't trust my Ruby mirror because I didn't have it. And so I was really nervous about the fact that like, what are people going to think? I, I can't remember anything from beforehand. And so um, to solve that problem, I dug into user experience research through the lens of Clubhouse. So I would sit in these Clubhouse rooms, because this is a big thing back in 2020, and I would be in a room with some of the best UX designers and UI builders that were out there in the space. Um, and eventually I got confident and would go up on stage and ask questions. And the questions I would ask were, what are the questions that you asked to get it right? And that helps me uncover like, cause questions are your pickaxes to figure out like what stone you're working with. And so that helped me like build the right, really good questions to go to my, you know, in my tool belt, because ultimately when we have these problems we face, we have to ask the sharp questions, let the story come forward. We don't want to use our bias or like our concepts of how we think it's going to work or what problem it might be when we do that, because it can kind of uh, curb how we look at that problem. Um, another question I asked was, if you were entering the space today, knowing what you know now, what advice would you have given your former self? And then um, the third was, um, if you could put any term, like any type of content or education in your path, what would like what would you put in your path? And so, the questions again, that was those tools in my tool belt. Um, the uh, the advice to your former self. Um, there was a theme with it. It was change is hard. Like it was one of the consistent pieces. I wish I would have understood how hard change is. It is so much harder than you think it is. It was so much like, and this was like a consistent theme, whether the person was from Google or Facebook or like, you know, Twitter or like whatever company it was that like change being hard was one of those other themes. And then um, when it came to the advice to the education, um, the answers to that question were what I used to rebuild my foundation. And so there was some consistent themes about like human centered design from Stanford C school. And so I would go and get that content back when I was like able to, I, I can't read books anymore, but I can listen to them. Um, and so I would listen to Stanford D school books and like these different pieces, which again, like came back and helped me build kind of the framework of, of how, 
how I view the world. And um, the interesting thing um, that I didn't realize when I was going about this, because again, it was because I had a head injury and was really nervous about how people were gonna interact with me. Um, but it turns out when we go into situations, we really shouldn't bring our rearview mirror with us. We should just be taking the sharp questions in order to understand what the problem is. Because what I found is that when I hit my head, I lost my design bias for how it had been done before. And it actually allowed me to build things that um, solve the problem the right way in different ways. So how I'm assuming you make new memories given that you're you know telling. And so how do you keep that alive? Because now you have two years of memories that could become this new design bias. What does that look like? How do we do that as humans? Yeah, so, um, you know, I use a double diamond model of design when I'm looking to like, um, I guess, build the right thing. So like, what is the problem and define what the problem is. And then there's that second diamond, which is build that thing right. So um, you never solution when you're in one of the diamonds. That's all in the other one. But when I'm in that first diamond of like trying to figure out what is the actual problem, um, I honestly like think about if I was to encounter this post head injury and didn't have that rear view mirror, how would I be looking at this and would I be looking at it differently? So when I'm looking at that, like what's going on, what's working, what doesn't, what do we, you know, like some of those different pieces and asking those questions, I view it as Again, it's the Jenny that I just hit her head. So like if I was stepping into this or if I was um, somebody who just stepped in off the street, right? Like what would they see as a problem? Not necessarily what is me with my more refined way of understanding how problems work. Uh, because ultimately when you're trying to capture what the problem is, I think one of the big other things that I found is that um, when we have these really effective tools of being able to like reverse engineer problems, sometimes we end up reverse engineering them in Greek and nobody can read Greek. And so <laughs> like, if you're having to transition this problem statement over to a different team to go and build, if they're not gonna understand it, if it's not in like a consumable form, I'm not gonna be able to build the right thing, right? And so making sure again, that like when you're going to define that problem, you're doing so in a way that could be explained to a 10 year old not necessarily in a way that's for like a biophysicist or like some sort of like, I don't know, Android engineer or something like that. Like you wanna make sure that you're doing so um, a little bit more in like layperson terms because if, because change is hard, right? And so part of this is defining the problem is making sure that we're capturing what the problem looks like to more than just the experts. Um, because when you do it that way, your transition, when you go to build, right, like that change management aspect, which is bringing that problem to life or that solution back to life, it's a lot easier because you also have to story tell, um, the why and the how. So, yeah, it's, it's so, it's so powerful, right? As someone who's read, read the book that, that we wrote, it's, we talk about that catalysts so often assume everybody sees the problem because it seems so obvious to us. And so what you're talking about is um, pushing past what our natural experience is, recognizing it as a superpower, which is a moment to be like, oh no, this isn't just a thing we're all out. And then explaining it, defining the problem, and then pushing past my rear view here, oh, my my past and, and how I would talk about it and how how would someone else see this problem? What is the language of other people how would I translate this to the simplest common denominator to a 10 year old and never making assumptions that everybody is seeing this from the same point of view? Yeah, that is such an incredible gift. It's really, really important too, because again, that whole concept of like that, that consistent theme of change is hard. Yeah. Change is hard. Getting the adoption is hard. You can have yeah. the really cool, sexy tech, but if that sexy tech doesn't come to like, if people don't use it, doesn't matter how sexy it was, right? Yeah. Like um, those different concepts, like you have to story tell this to people about like what's in it for me. And yeah. if they can't understand, and again, the 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 gift of building this um, or building your solutions in a way that are consumable for the, the common denominator, everybody can understand it. 
right? Yeah. Like it's not just the experts. It's not just the 10%. It's everybody. And so I'll never forget, like, I mean, we built conversational AI technology um, that had never been done before in this way um, to solve for uh, hiring in our salons and in my former role. And I had to message it and explain it to um, my salon managers and stylists like to get the buy-in because guess what? If you don't have a stylist to cut hair, you can't open your doors because that's right. Talent. And so I'll never forget, I had built the right thing. I brought a cross section of the users to the table in order to like make them co-creators. We had done all this, but we were bringing it to market. And I was having a conversation with one of, um, one of the franchise consultants, just kind of going over this with her. And she really candidly said like, it's not gonna work. And I was like, okay, why? And she goes, we cut hair. And I go, why does that matter? And she goes, you can't talk at us. And I was like, why? And like <laughs> the five whys exercise, right? Where you try to like unpack this. And ultimately what it came to is like, they learn by doing, they don't learn by talking at them. And so I remember calling, a, calling a, one of my contacts at, uh, at the technology company. And I said, um, we're going to do this differently. I've got somebody coming in. They know nothing about what we're doing. I want you to try this, 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 which is really like we were having them experience the technology firsthand instead of talking at them about how it worked. And um, again, this person had no idea what we had built or what was going on. We were able to take them, Tracy, from concept to mastery on the concept like in 14 minutes <gasps> and directly taken like two weeks. And so had I been like, had I not paused to listen to that feedback, right, or taken it personally, I wouldn't have been able to iterate or, or shift or, as I always say, like, you can't cut hair with, with uh, you know, dull scissors, so you got to sharpen your, your processes and your technologies to get it right. Um, I wouldn't have sharpened it and we wouldn't have been able to likely get it as right as we did, so. I could ask you about the things that you have learned for hours and days. Um, thank you for those gifts. I'm going to shift us to do our rapid fire because yes. otherwise I, I'm going to end up with a five hour podcast because I'm so curious. <laughs> um, so I need to, to self-manage. So you've shared a lot of nuggets, but if, you know, it's the same questions that you asked in um, uh, clubhouse to the designers that you bravely got on stage with, what advice do you have for a young catalyst today? Oh gosh. Um, hmm. Losers have goals, winners have systems. Ah, um, I never heard that. Oh, seriously, I did not coin this, by the way. This is I, cool I understand the embarrassed. But um, I, I truly believe that. Like, you need your systems for success, and your systems for success are not, well, they're not one size fits all. So my systems for what works for me are going to be very different from what works for Tracy. But what you have to do is constantly be building what your systems for success are. And then after you get done with something, it's asking what worked, what didn't, what do I change? And like, how could I improve, right? To be able to sharpen those systems in order to like help you get it right. And um, I would definitely say that piece. Um, I would also challenge that in the corporate world, it's about getting it right, not about being right. And so in order to get it right, you have to bring people along um, in your journey. And that's really, really, really hard to do, especially when you know, again, you can see this ecosystem, like you see the Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, or the North Star, wherever it is, like you can see the constellation. Um, nobody else can, they just see noise. And so if you, if you truly wanna get it right, it's not about getting your problem to the finish line. It's about getting the collective goal to the finish line. And so you've got to put personal feelings aside. And so I think that's a really big one, um, big one too. Um, and I have a, I have it on my, my wallet. It says, be kind to your mind. Um, so your mind is one of the most incredible gifts that like you have and you have to take care of it. You have to, and sometimes you hit your head and you lose everything, right? But like being able to make sure that you are 
figuring out what your soft guardrails are, where your speed bumps are, where your hard guardrails are, like when you're going to crash into that like cement cement barrier at 80 miles an hour or 90 miles an hour. Um, that's really, really, really important. And um, again, there is no one size fits all with this. Like the blueprint for what makes you you and what drives and what drains you is going to be very different than your other catalyst peer. Um, but like, you've got to figure it out. If you want to get it right, you've really got to figure out what works for you and be able to constantly iterate on that. And also understand like, there's a million ways to solve problems, right? Like it's about what is the right way to get again it's about getting that problem to the finish line and that problem to the finish line doesn't necessarily always mean it's my way of solving it it's about getting the collective group to it and so um yeah so those are just some different pieces that was beautiful thank you every single one of them is just a nugget of gold all right what's the worst part about being a catalyst mm -hmm. um getting in your own way i think <laughs> And what I mean by that is um, sometimes the, the inner monologue I can tell about what's going on in a situation is not very kind to myself. Um, I, I kind of will not really talk as kindly as I should to myself. And, uh, you know, like, it's not always that bad, but like you are the thoughts that you put in your mind are are truly like hard coding and hard wiring like how your operating system works and so make sure that you're checking what you're saying to yourself and have some sort of way to interrupt that uh um sometimes like that rabbit hole right like in yeah. being able to i don't know take things personally or like nobody likes me or like different things like that it's like sometimes we are so good at solving problems um, that we forget that we put the wrong lens on the situation and um, we're just seeing it from one point of view. And I think when you're able to add like different lenses to the mix, a catalyst becomes unstoppable. But if it's just your own lens on the situation, um, sometimes you can be very unkind to yourself. And so it's it's lonely, it's hard to make friends. A lot of people, I think catalyst innate baseline is to like trust is there, right? Like, so if I meet another catalyst, it's just like you have this almost like assumed it's safe, it's trusting, like that's just how it is. But other people don't always have that. And so you have to build trust and tactical empathy, which is sometimes hard. I know for me, it's really hard because post head injury, I don't always see certain social cues. And so being able to like understand Maybe it's like, because I'm very direct and assertive and it's not because I'm trying to be mean. I just don't even understand what passive aggressiveness is. Like I, it's a sharpening of technology. It's not a foundational piece and I'm only two years old really. And so like some people just think that like you're trying to be mean and it's like, no, I'm not. But all of this to say, understand that. And sometimes you can get in your own way and I've, I've gotten really good at like an accusation audit. So like being able to say, Hey, I'm still learning. If I come off as this, this, or that, can you please tell me? Because I really, I I'm trying to get better at this and I want to truly, and I don't want to make anybody feel badly. And I don't always know, um, when I'm, when I'm hitting those things. And so, um, yeah, I think, that's a very nonlinear answer, but I hope that it's, but it, it ties so much of what you talked about in terms of, you know, as, never assuming that one way of looking at it is the way to look at it. How do you reframe a problem from what other people might see? How do you get feedback? And like you said, lenses from other people. And then the accusation audit is such a beautiful tactical, you know, like, Hey, this is what's true about me. This is my learning edge. Can you help me be better? There's just, there's so much grace. So I found it to be incredibly perfect and linear. But well, what's the best part? Piece, oh yeah, right? tell me. Yeah, one more piece there. Um, it's, it, Torn Ellis taught me another question to ask and it's who's not present here in mm. the conversation. And so he's a diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging kind of um, thought leader. And when I was building technology, he would always ask who's not present here. And it started becoming part of like my you know, problem unpacking situation, because so yeah. often if you have just that one group of people 
who's like, you're, you're only defining one group of the people's problems. Like that's not your entire cross section of users or people right. in the might have different needs. Like the, the question, who am I not seeing here? But also um, like what else could be going on or what am I not capturing is really important. Because like, again, if your goal is to get it right, you got to check your own bias of like, mm -hmm. am I missing anything else? What else could like, what else needs to be here? And that's where, again, taking those, asking those sharp questions, like making sure that you're taking those, those intakes. So it's not just your, I mean, I have like data or it didn't happen. <laughs> like, <I have> different <laughs> like, that's that, the other learning how to, if you are a catalyst, you need to learn how to tell stories and numbers because often you will know the right answer but you will not have something to back it up. And so learning how to tell stories and numbers and connect the dots to those pieces is absolutely critical if you wanna be successful in business. I love it. Another thread throughout the conversation, that's storytelling. Yeah. Storytelling. Okay, so what's the best part about being a catalyst? As a catalyst, it's not a teeter-totter, it's an elevator. And you get to choose what floor you go to, there's no ceiling. And so if you take care of yourself, like you are gonna just continue to rise and the, the problems that you're gonna be able to solve, like it's it's really incredible. And so I think that's probably like the, there's that concept of like, when you break a glass ceiling, the ceiling becomes a floor type thing. But like with catalysts, it's like, it's truly really an elevator and like it's an infinite elevator and the catalyst is the one that's determining where they want to rise to because it's, it's in their power. And so I think that's the most exciting part is like it's infinite possibilities. I'm going to wrap us there because that left me with goosebumps and that I that's where I want to leave leave our audience. So with with deep, deep gratitude. Oh, my gosh, Jessica, thank you so much for being here with me. I have deeply, deeply enjoyed our conversation. Thank you, Tracy, so much for being the guide like a lot of what we talk about with a hero's journey and their arc is they meet that guy that tells them how, like who they are, what they do, like helps them figure out their powers. And this book was my guide. And like, you are tooling people with being able to understand what does life, life look like in the second act. And so thank you truly for, for helping all of us out there. Oh, that is so kind and you're welcome. It's, it's definitely, it's definitely a purpose-led led a journey that, that we're on and clearly on together. Thank you. Well, thank you to the listening audience. If you'd like to learn more about how to accelerate positive change, go to our website at www.catalystconstellations.com. Be sure to check out our book, Move Fast, Break, Ship, Burn Out. And if you have other catalysts in your life, hit the share button and send a link their way. Thanks again. Thanks, Jen.